Hello. So I am back. I just got home from the gym and I was like, what can I share with you guys while I get in the zone to continue writing about this letter to the church in Philadelphia? So I am going to write about a concept that is very basic and um, fundamental to the aspect of humility that we as believers should possess on account of the grace that we have been given. And it has to do with the open door that has been Put before us and having little strength. So this is the next part. Uh, if you guys caught the last video that I did regarding the letter to the church in Philadelphia and the gospel of the kingdom, because that is what this epistle is, is it is kingdom based from beginning to end. Every single part of the letter to the church in Philadelphia is kingdom based. So let's talk about the open door. Because an open door implies passage through it gets you into something, into somewhere. <laughs> so what is this open door as opposed to a closed door? Let's go through this. Uh, where I left off before, if it wasn't clear before, perhaps after understanding where these references originate regarding Jesus having the key of David, which is the opening of this letter, we can see this letter to the church in Philadelphia is going to be all about the kingdom. So let us see what Jesus has to say next. So again, if you didn't catch the first one I did, uh, go back and check that out. This is the second part leaving off, uh, picking up where that left off. So the next part, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Open door that no man can shut. So this is the first thing that come to mind that, that came to mind when I read this. Came to my mind anyway, is Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Open door that no man can shut. God's gonna send it and it's gonna do what he wants it to do, regardless of who stands in its way. So that's the first thing I think of when I read that, but let's continue. Because this refers, the open door refers to the preaching of the gospel and that his word is going to go where he sends it, regardless of who stands in its way. This is the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel. It will not return unto him void. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hearing, believing, receiving the spirit and entering the kingdom. So hearing, believing, receiving, entering. The end result of believing in Christ is being allowed to enter. Thus, the gospel is the open door to the kingdom. Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Paul refers to the gospel of Christ as the path to eternal life, because how do you get your eternal life? 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they which also who have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So I said before that, Paul refers to the gospel of Christ as the path to eternal life. Where does one suppose they shall live out said eternal life? In the kingdom, of course. Since we understand now, hopefully, that the premise of this letter is related to the kingdom, it's easy to make the leap that open doors mean access is granted and closed doors mean access is denied. Knowing this, it then becomes easier to understand just how the following parable relates to believers entering the kingdom through the open door and unbelievers being shut out of the kingdom 
via the closed door. Matthew 25, 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven <laughs> be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. This is a kingdom parable. Entrance by the open door and being excluded via the closed door. That's literally exactly the purpose of this parable. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took in their vessels with, uh, took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose from their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So they went in through the open door. This is a kingdom parable. They're going into the kingdom through the open door. The door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Going into the kingdom through the open door. Getting excluded from the kingdom via the closed door. Hello, Tom and Christine. Welcome to you both. It is unfortunate, so very unfortunate, how confusing that parable is made to be at times when it is quite simple in its meaning. Believers will get into the kingdom and unbelievers will not. We shall see more evidence of this when we get to the next chapter, uh, Revelation 4, because What's John invited to see the hereafter through? The open door. There was a door opened in heaven. <laughs> Glimpse into the kingdom of God in heaven. Because the first thing he sits is, uh, sees is God sitting on the throne. Thrones equal king equals kingdom. Believers will get into the kingdom. Unbelievers will not. We'll see more evidence of this when we get to the next chapter. For John was invited to glimpse into the kingdom of God in heaven through said open door, Revelation 4, 1, after this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Coming back to the letter to the church in Philadelphia, we're told those to whom the open door has been granted are those who have not denied his name. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. The only way to get to the father is through the son. And we will be shown a very literal image of this also in Revelation 4. So the next chapter is going to be very interesting to go through, but we have to finish this one first. However, we're introduced to this premise actually when we went through the last epistle, which was the letter to the church in Sardis. Revelation 3, 4, thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Those who have kept his word and have not denied his name are those who have believed in Jesus. Because what is his word? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son who is called the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So keeping his word is keeping Christ, believing on Jesus Christ and being saved. For God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, who is the Word. Interestingly enough, there is also a second reference to those who have kept his word later in the same letter to Philadelphia. The reiteration draws our attention to the fact that believing in Jesus Christ is the only way to get into the kingdom. However, Believing in Jesus Christ is all that is needed to get into the kingdom. So to continue our discussion of this verse, let's look at it again, because we're going to go through another part of it. I know that it works before I have set, uh, behold, I have set before thee an open door. So we know what the open door is. It's the gospel message and entrance into the kingdom. No man can shut it. Nope, because it's going to go and it's going to do what God wants it to do. 
for thou hast little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. So they're believers. We've already established that the open door is the gospel. They're believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does it, uh, why does Jesus call attention to this church's little strength? You know, this is something that I have often thought about, just kind of a, a side note. This is something that's been tossed around, like, was it a tiny church and they just didn't have enough strength to, like, affect change around them? That's not what it's talking about at all. Why does Jesus call attention to this church's little strength? It kind of seems out of place. Well, they're believers. They believe in the gospel. They've been granted entrance into the kingdom through the open door. They've not denied his name. So why would he draw attention to their little strength? For a couple of reasons, I believe they might have little strength, but the one who keeps them, the one who saved them, the one who they believe in is not so limited. Colossians 1.11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. They have little strength, but they are strengthened with all might according to his power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Ephesians 6.10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So they have little strength. Are they required to do it on their own? No. Are they supposed to even try? No. And Paul gave us the perfect example of this in 2 Corinthians 12.6. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. We have little strength because our job is to glorify the one who has much strength. If we could do it on our own, what would be the point of trying to rest in him, trying to look to him, trying to receive help from him, to acknowledge him? We must decrease so that he can increase. They have little strength because that that emphasizes their need to continue to look to him. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength, his strength, is made perfect in our weakness. So they have little strength because the point of that is to glorify him and to look to him who is not weak, who does not possess little strength. His strength is sufficient and it's made perfect or his grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. Most, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Looking to self requires us to take our focus off of God. If we can do it all on our own, why do we need him? This is an error in judgment that way too many people make. We cannot do it on our own. We don't need to be strong. He's strong. His strength is more than sufficient to tackle even our biggest problems. Redirection of focus is typically all that is needed. Easier said than done sometimes, I know this. But like anything else, this is a habit. We run this race with patience and endurance. Let us continue uh, to the next words of wisdom that Jesus imparted to Philadelphia, which is actually repetitive to the letter of the church in Smyrna. So I'm going to stop here um, because this has to do with the dispensation of grace. Jews and Gentiles, co-equality, and how the Jews thought that they were better on account of their heritage. That is not so. Anyone who is in Christ (laughs) is going to be saved. doesn't matter what their original heritage is. Uh, And that is the meaning of, I know they works, tribulation, uh, no. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come to worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. This is literally a natural seed versus spiritual seed conversation. Already wrote about this when I went through the letter of the church of Smyrna. So I I pasted a significant amount of text there with a little bit extra here because there are a few verses which kind of emphasize this point, one of which is, who are Jews, Uh, Paul, who was a Jew, comes very clearly out in this, uh, where did I, oh, the part where it says, behold, I will make them come to worship before thy feet to know that I have loved thee. This is talking about the Gentiles, that God loves Gentiles too. Um, 
Romans 2. I don't want to get too much into this because it takes us kind of out of the focus of where I wanted to go with this, which was just what I talked about. But uh, Romans 2.28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So it's literally a natural seed versus spiritual seed conversation that those who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, are those who would say that because they are the children of Abraham through the natural seed of Isaac, that they need nothing else to be saved when that is not true because the only way one is saved is through the spiritual seed who came through Abraham also, the Redeemer who is Christ. And those who are Jews who are sons of Abraham are those who are of faith. They will be blessed with faithful Abraham. So uh, the Jews who believe that God loves them and not the Gentiles are going to be brought to understanding that he loves us too. Enter the whole of Ephesians 2. Read that chapter. (laughs) <laughs> and that is literally what Paul is talking all about in that um, in that conversation. Outward changes mean nothing if inward change hasn't occurred. And that was the, the Jewish problem as they were demonstrating obedience to the law. But in following Abraham's footsteps, it was faith comes first, then obedience to the faith. If you don't have faith first, then what are you being obedient toward? That was where the the Jews make the mistake because they're relying on obedience to the law. The law can't save them. The law is not a faith. Faith must come first and then obedience matters. Obedience does not matter if there is no faith first. Outward changes mean nothing if the inward change has not occurred. This was precisely why the law could not save anyone. It was outward demonstration that required no change of inward condition. We We can demonstrate our faith once we have it, hence the works and the obedience. But we cannot ever be justified by our works or our obedience. God is the only one that can justify us, and he does so through our faith. And he does so for all who come to him, regardless of whether they are Jew or Gentile, which is the meaning of, I will come to make them worship at your feet and to know that I have loved you. That is literally Ephesians 2. Um, and the next part is talking about a verse I'm sure just about everybody knows because I was kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, which thou hast that no man take thy crown. What crown is that talking about? We will see. That is what I am going to be working on this evening and probably tomorrow. And then we we will wrap this up. Um, But this is, For those of you who are unfamiliar with this or just have studied, like I know there are certain verses that people love to take out of this epistle. It is an epistle by Jesus to the church. And people just love to pull out the the rapture passage. Where are you going when you get raptured? To the kingdom. The open door that he set before you is to the kingdom. And what is the first thing that's shown after the rapture of the church? God in heaven, sitting on the throne in the kingdom of God in heaven. This is a kingdom epistle through and through and through and through and through. If you don't think so, then please tell me where you are going when you get raptured. I'm going to the kingdom of God (laughs) in my immortal, incorruptible body. And I will hopefully see you guys there too. (laughs) Um, In fact, it's kind of funny. Just kind of note this is. Um, in Revelation 7, John's up there. He's witnessing the multitude that no man can number, which is the redeemed sons of Abraham through Christ in the present dispensation. The multitude that no man can number is what Abraham was promised by faith to have descendants that number as the sands of the sea, the stars of the sky, the dust of the earth, innumerable. Multitude that no man can number, innumerable. Those are the redeemed sons of Abraham through Christ. And they are shown in glorified bodies in the throne room. And it's it's very kind of intriguing to wonder which elder came up to John and was talking to him. Was it John talking to John? Was it Peter talking to John? Like, who was the elder? (laughs) Were they kind of laughing? Because I kind of get the impression. He's like, who are they? He's like, dude, you know who they are. They're the ones who were kept out of per the promise that we're going to go through in the next verse because I was kept the word in my page and I also will keep thee out of the hour of temptation. Uh, keep thee from the hour of temptation, keep thee out of great tribulation. 
Um, and that premise about tribulation, great tribulation was already made in the letter of the church of Thyatira. So if you have not read that and you're going to uh, wonder or have your own ideas or, I mean, you can have your own ideas, but if you're going to wonder who the multitude that no man can number is coming out of great tribulation in Revelation 7. That premise was already established in the letter of the church of Thyatira. Tribulation, great tribulation, and great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor shall ever be. Three different terms, three different time periods mentioned, and great tribulation does not refer to the second half of the 70th week. It refers to the 70th week as a whole. The second half is great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor shall ever be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That's the second half of the 70th week. <laughs> All of this is going to be talked about, um, touched upon in the rest of this verse, the rest of this church letter, the letter to Church of Philadelphia, talking about the rapture. Where are these people going to be pictured in the next chapters to come? Chapter four, chapter five, chapter seven. Same group of people. Who are they? We will get there. So um, <laughs> anyway, there's a lot coming. This is a very long letter so far. I have, I think, four verses left to go through, and so far I have written fourteen pages. So it's probably going to be about twenty-ish pages total. This letter to the Church of Philadelphia uh, in Philadelphia, and then we'll get to the letter to the Church of the Laodiceans. That is going to be fun. Um, and then we'll be done with the seven letters of the seven churches and we can get into the prophetic part of Revelation. As always, if you guys have questions, comments, or feedback, let me know. Have a good night and I will see you later.